Hi, I'm Bill Schapp. Another one. Another culprit. We're really honored to have you here tonight. It's an incredible crowd, and it makes us feel very, very good to have you all here, however it makes you feel to be here. I want to mention before I, I speak there, there, in addition to Covert Action's 15th anniversary, there's one other anniversary tonight. It is the birthday of our third co-founder, Ellen Ray, who's just a teeny weeny bit older than Covert Action. But, but the numbers are classified and you know that we never divulge anything that's classified. I have to agree with Lou that no one could be more surprised than we at the longevity of covert action, at the fact that it not only has lasted 15 years, but it's going stronger and fulfilling the hope we started in the very beginning, although it was much easier then than it is now. And every time we did an issue, we vowed it was going to be better than the one before. And you keep on trying to do that, and obviously it gets harder and harder, but I think that Covert Action Quarterly has become an impressive magazine, and that that has to have something to do with its longevity and its, its popularity, or its popularity with our friends and its uh, the reverse with, uh, with the other side. But if any of you, and some of you may perhaps have seen, if any of you had seen how we started, you really wouldn't believe we got to this point. I mean, we were working out of our spare bedroom. We were doing everything ourselves. Lou and Ellen and I did everything, we, in the except for, for Phil Agee, who would always write something for the uh, magazine. We were writing everything. We were checking everything. We were typing everything. We didn't have a computer in the beginning for quite a while. We didn't have page setting. We would work with scrolls of waxed galleys. We would stay, for some reason, we thought that timeliness was very important. And the minute the galleys we were, were done, we thought we had to get the magazine to the printer at the next possible, humanly possible second. And we would stay up 30, 40, 50 hours nonstop, looking really revolting by the end when we brought the galleys in, up all night with the rollers rubbing down these wax galleys. And then you discover, instead of the, it was T-E-H. And you can't, you, it would take two days if you sent the thing back to the typesetters to print the thing. So you take an exacto, have you ever done this on 10 point type? You take an exacto knife and you have to cut the T-E-H and you cut off the E and the H and you stick it in, you pull out the H and you push the E over and you stick the H back in and you press it down, now you got the. And you hope that the magazine doesn't come out with T blank E, and there's a picture with an H on the forehead. <laughs> that happened a couple of times. Now, now we've gotten a little bit smoother, but I still, I can't say that we're on the cutting edge of the technological revolution in this world. <laughs> on the other hand, I can say that, uh, to quote Huey Newton, we have proved that the power of the people is greater than the man's technology because we really had very little technology. What we had were friends all around the world, all around the country, who got in touch with us, who got us the information, who wrote the stories, who developed the information, and let us turn Covert Action into the magazine that it is today, and let it have the impact that it can have. As modest as it may be, it's one weapon in a struggle that we're all a part of. Anyway, we've made it 15 years. We're very, very happy that you're all here to, to help us to celebrate. It's a great honor for me to have Noam Chomsky here to introduce to you. We've all known each other for many years, and he's been a devoted supporter and a magnificent contributor, not only to our magazine, but several thousand others. <laughs> this is one of the most prolific, not only one of the most prolific writers around, but one of the 
best writers around. Absolutely. I, I mostly edit these days, and he is about the easiest person in the world to edit. We have a very simple understanding. You just don't change a word. <laughs> and you don't have to because only professors of linguistics and a few other people, every sentence parses. It's just, it's just a delight. And some of you who write for us know what I'm talking about because you guys give us a hard time. But I say, uh, you know, if, uh, if you don't like what Noam Chomsky has to say, you don't ask him to write for you. We like what he has to say, we ask him to write for us, and he does. And there are, there are a lot of people who don't like what Noam has to say. There's, these are the, the power brokers who have tried for so many years to marginalize him. But you can't marginalize a genius like Noam Chomsky, particularly as prolific a man who churns out books and articles, who speaks almost nonstop, who wears himself out, I'm sorry to say, a bit in, in the struggle. We heard a story from his wife one time, I don't even know if Noam knows this, who was telling us that she'd gotten a call from his dentist and said, look, I, I, don't, I didn't want to say this to Noam, but, but I've got to ask you this. It's a very common problem. Does, does Noam grind his teeth in his sleep? Many people do this, and he had a problem with, with teeth being ground down. And she laughed, and she said, no, he grinds his teeth when he reads the New York Times. <laughs> He's also a man, the only one I know, who actually answers just about every letter and every inquiry he ever gets. He's a, a one-person networking service. I, there are thousands of people, probably many of you in this room, who have contacted or been contacted by thousands of other people who write a letter or, or make a phone call that starts with, Noam Chomsky said you were the person I should get in touch with about this. And Noam's been doing that for years, and it's an invaluable service. It's been incredible for us. Some of the best people who've written for Covert Action, who've written for Lies of Our Times, who've written for other magazine, have been people that Noam has goaded into doing just that, into calling up those people, tell them you got this information, and write an article. But let me, let me get serious for a minute. When, you, when you're asked to introduce one of the most brilliant intellects alive today, you have to do a little research. So I had to look Noam up, I had to go to, not, not just to the encyclopedias or the who's who, that's easy, anybody can get in an encyclopedia or a who's who, but I went to the dictionary. No, this guy is in the dictionary. <laughs> not only is Chomsky in the dictionary, Chomskyism is in the dictionary. <laughs> now, I, the problem is the only other guy I know that happened to was Joe McCarthy, so I'm not sure exactly what this means. <laughs> So I looked that up to be prepared for all you people, and I'm, I'm reading this, and there's all this stuff in there about the world's foremost authority, not the world's foremost authority, that, that's um, uh, the comedian in, in uh, New York, that's the professor, but it said the world's leading authority on phonemes. And I'm looking at this, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I said, this is very rare for dictionary. There's a typo in my dictionary. I said, because I know Noam. Noam is not an expert on phonemes. He's an expert on phonies. He's an expert on phony politicians, phony business tycoons, phony journalists. That's the Noam that we know. So I want to leave you with this thought. If you want to know about phonemes, you have to go to MIT. But if you want to learn about phonies, listen to our speaker, Dr. Noam Chomsky.
seven or eight. There ought to be 12 up there. Isn't that where the jury sits or something? <laughs> now I'm getting worried. Uh, ah, good. Let's, a few more volunteer. Uh, what the uh, title I suggested a couple of months ago, uh, Clinton's Vision, uh, I didn't realize at the time how appropriate it would be and what a, uh, an abundance of riches there would be to discuss it. Uh, the phrase power against the people was added later uh, after the uh, vision became uh, uh, manifested in, in action a little more. Uh, the, uh, the word vision has become one of the most frequent words in the English language. I think it's incumbent on every journalist who's commenting on the, uh, uh, the administration and its activities to throw the word vision in at least three or four times, usually with the adjective grand or something in front of it. Uh, the, uh, 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 it's true that every president has to come along with a vision. That's part of the tools of the trade. Uh, but this one has really uh, reached a peak of uh, exuberance and uh, uh, exposure that goes a bit beyond the norm. Well, the vision was announced. Uh, th there were two phases to it. There was an announcement and then the achievement to uh, uh, bring the announcement to reality. The announcement was in the last couple of days of September. There were three or four days there where there was a series of speeches by the President, the Secretary of State, uh, the uh, National Security Advisor, the Ambassador of the UN, uh, all of which presented uh, the Clinton vision of uh, foreign policy. And then uh, in the following months, particularly in November, came the realization of the vision, both foreign and domestic, uh, first with the passage of uh, what is misleadingly called the North American Free Trade Agreement. It's not totally misleading. It does have to do with North America. Uh, the, uh, so that version of NAFTA uh, was the major achievement that was followed immediately by uh, an anti-crime bill and by the uh, triumph at the Asian Pacific uh, Summit uh, out in Seattle. Uh, well, uh, that's what I want to talk about, these, uh, the vision, the announcement, the achievement. And I think the easiest way to do it is to kind of unravel it backwards. So let's start with the end, uh, with the Asia Pacific uh, meeting uh, in Seattle, where the vision was finally consummated. Uh, with great praise, I should say, there was much swooning over the grand vision, the greatest rethinking of US policy toward Asia in half a century. Uh, headlines like Clinton preaches open markets at summit, uh, which was quite true. He did preach open markets at summit. The at the summit, uh, the uh, uh, performance came to its peak uh, at uh, with a major speech that Clinton delivered, in which he selected. Uh, he spoke uh, at a corporation at the uh, uh, in a, in the buildings of a corporation, which he designated as the model for his vision of the free market future. Uh, for Asia. Uh, the corporation was the Boeing Corporation. Uh, he spoke in a hangar there uh, and pointed out accurately that Boeing is the leading U.S. exporter, uh, 18. Uh, in fact, he could have go gone on to say that civilian aircraft uh, are the leading U.S. export I manufactured item, uh, $18 billion uh, a year ago, or two ago. I could have gone on to add further that the major, uh, that the real U.S. comparative advantage in world trade these days is shifting from manufacturing to what are called services, uh, and about a third of the export surplus is aircraft related, meaning tourism and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're really, it was a, it was a wise choice. Uh, that's the model that the free market vision for the future should. Uh, should uh, copy. Uh, there are, of course, a few questions that could be raised. Uh, the idea of selecting Boeing aircraft as the model for a free market future does uh, uh, perhaps uh, arouse a slight bit of puzzlement. 
Boeing, as is well known, is a publicly subsidized corporation. It is a private corporation, meaning the profit is private, uh, but the public pays for it. Uh, Boeing wouldn't exist if it weren't for an enormous public subsidy uh, that comes through the Pentagon and through NASA and so on. Uh, when you fly a Boeing airplane, as I did this morning, uh, you're flying a modified bomber. Uh, the technology and the uh, research and the development and the avionics and everything else were paid for by the public, including the Boeing workers. Uh, and if indeed civilian aircraft is our, as it is, our major, uh, our major manufacturing export, and if uh, uh, tourism-related services are our major service export, uh, that simply shows uh, how the uh, how it's possible for a capitalist economy to survive if it completely abandons free market principles uh, and uh, uh, rather relies upon extensive public subsidy in which public funds are provided to uh, uh, what's called private enterprise for them to use to maximize the profit of their uh, investors and owners and uh, CEOs and so on. That's the model for the future. Actually, if you for the free market future. Uh, if you look a little beyond into the small print and the laudatory articles, uh, you'll find that uh, the decision of the Boeing executives these days is to carry out what the press call, what the New York Times, I'm quoting, calls job-creating investment. So that's nice, you want to create jobs with the funds that you give them, except that those jobs are going to be created overseas uh, because it's much more profitable that way. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the Boeing executives make use of the public funds that are provided to them by their workforce and their communities and the rest of us in order to carry out job enhancement programs overseas because they make more profit that way. Uh, and uh, as the Times put it, this is being done on a scale which would make the most uh, harshest, which would make the harshest critic of NAFTA wince if they knew about it. But fortunately, the people who are paying the bill, the bills, including the Boeing workers, aren't supposed to know about it unless they got to paragraph, you know, 83 of the relevant article in the New York Times. Uh, well, that's the model. That's the first. That's the major model uh, for the free market future for Asia. Uh, there was another one. Uh, at the same time, also announced at the summit, and that was Cray Supercomputers. Uh, Clinton announced that, uh, uh, that he had made a deal with China uh, by which China would be provided with supercomputers from the Cray Corporation, uh, and that's another model for the free market future that we're cheering about. Well, of course, Cray Supercomputers is another corporation that's publicly subsidized. Uh, computers exist because of uh, massive uh, public funding uh, directed through the Pentagon and the DOE and uh, NASA uh, um, be from the very beginning in the 1950s when computers were not marketable, too big and clumsy. Uh, the public paid about close to 100 percent of the costs of research and development and provided a market for them. Uh, the state guaranteed market that's the Pentagon's primary domestic function. Uh, as they got more profitable, the public share was cut back because then private corporations to whom uh, these uh, public resources were handed over were able to make money from them. Uh, in the 1980s, when there were new computer developments, expensive ones, fifth generation computers and massively parallel computers and so on, the public share went up again. Uh, things like Star Wars were primarily a cover for development of these uh, new systems, then again handed over to uh, private enterprise. And in fact, Star Wars was sold to the business community uh, quite openly as uh, a method of uh, compelling the public to uh, pay the research and development costs uh, for the next generation of computers and lasers and fancy electronics and so on. Uh, and that, in fact, goes way back. The, uh, uh, back in the late 1940s, uh, the uh, business press was calling for uh, direct government intervention to enable U.S. advanced industry to survive, recognizing that it couldn't do it in any other way. And the Pentagon was selected pretty consciously as the optimal way of doing this from the point of view of corporate managers. Uh, the aeronautical industry is one of the main examples. 
with everything that uh, that came out of it, including you know fancy metallurgy and electronics and so on and so forth. So that's a kind of an in, that's the, so the second model of the uh, the free market future that we are applauding uh, is another public major publicly funded institution handed over to private profit uh, when it become when its output becomes marketable uh, and now being offered to uh, China. Uh, the offer to China is itself kind of interesting. Uh, the uh, uh, China was, uh, it was announced at the summit, at, simultaneously with the summit, that China would be provided not only with supercomputers, but also with uh, uh, US uh, 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 products that can be used for nuclear power generation, generators for nuclear power plants from GE and so on. Uh, and. Uh, 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 also other high technology exports. Uh, these uh, are being offered to China in violation of recent congressional legislation uh, which bans export of high technology materials to China uh, after Congress was informed by the intelligence system, apparently conclusively, that China was involved in proliferation of uh, uh, missiles in violation of international conventions uh, and probably uh, nuclear weapons proliferation as well. Well, uh, according to the Clinton administration, the supercomputers are going to be used for weather forecasting. Uh, but uh, Pentagon analysts quickly pointed out that uh, nobody's going to know whether they're used for weather forecasting. The same computers can be used for missile development. Uh, the transfer of technology from nuclear power generation to uh, nuclear weapons is a very small one. So there's a strong chance, in fact, a likelihood that the Clinton administration is now engaged directly in technology transfer, which will contribute to further uh, nuclear proliferation and uh, missile proliferation in violation of international conventions. And also, uh, this just as the choice of the Boeing Corporation and the uh, Cray supercomputers illustrates the uh, model for the free trade future that we're envisioning. Similarly, these decisions to contribute to uh, nuclear weapons and missile proliferation illustrate the second major plank of the uh, Clinton vision, namely its opposition to proliferation. If you read the proper articles in the New York Times, you'll, elsewhere you'll discover that the Clinton vision for the future has three basic elements. One the commitment to uh, free trade, to the commitment to stop proliferation of missiles and nuclear weapons, and third, human rights. Well, the human rights component is illustrated by the first sale of high technology material to China after the Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, at the same, uh, just out of an intriguing conjunction, the very same articles that lauded these achievements uh, at the very bottom, you know, they found a few lines with a little Reuters report uh, noting that 81 people had just died in a factory fire in China where they had been locked in to keep them at work. Uh, this is one of the a joint uh, Hong Kong-China uh, economic ventures which is contributing to what's called an economic miracle in southeastern China. Uh, the, it's a fact that happened to be a factory that makes dolls probably for sale to American children on Christmas presents and we can only hope that they uh, manage to get the dried blood washed off before they send them here. Uh, there was a series of other stories within the same days on other atrocities of a similar nature. Uh, so our commitment, so let's say to uh, simply to summarize, our commitment to the free market is illustrated by uh, the examples of our commitment to the free market vision of the future are state subsidized, meaning publicly subsidized, private profit corporations uh, where the management, which of course has the right to do this in our system, carries out job enhancement programs elsewhere, uh, eliminating, dispersing public funds to eliminate the jobs of US workers, because that's the way you can be more profitable. Uh, our commitment to uh, human rights and non-proliferation is illustrated by high-tech exports to major human rights violators who were involved in missile and nuclear proliferation. 
uh, and uh, human rights such as, for example, the right not to be burned to death in the factory that you're working where you're locked in, uh, that consideration is zero. Uh, Warren Christopher, the Secretary of State, explained the matter of uh, the congressional legislation which bans what they were doing by saying that uh, the administration, by explaining to the Chinese that the administration would interpret the congressional legislation banning export of high technology, uh, of high tech equipment to China, they would interpret it as permitting such export. So that took care of that problem. Uh, well, okay, that's the, uh, uh, that's the, that was the peak, you know, the, the final peak of the achievements uh, which illustrate the grand vision and uh, gave rise to the praise and the swooning and the applause and so on and so forth. Uh, now, intellectuals have a kind of a task at this point. They have to portray all of this as a triumph of our commitment to the free market and to human rights and to democracy. And intellectuals on the left or the left liberal side of the spectrum also have a task. They have to portray it all as a demonstration of how the, what's called these days, the politics of meaning uh, guides every thought of the uh, Clintons. And you want to make sure that uh, you understand these instructions properly. Uh, well, today happens to be Human Rights Day, so perhaps worthwhile mentioning that uh, the Clinton administration at the very same time, in fact a few days ago, just illustrated its refined sensibility with regard to human rights. Uh, the Congress uh, had passed legislation after considerable public pressure and lobbying and so on, passed legislation banning U.S. military training for Indonesian forces who are engaged in massive atrocities in uh, East Timor. Uh, but the White House announced that it was going to provide military training to Indonesian uh, military officers. Uh, and it explained that this was not in violation of the congressional legislation because the congressional legislation banned military training that the U.S. was paying for. But if Indonesia pays for the military training here, presumably using funds that we give them for that purpose, then that doesn't violate the congressional legislation. So that's the contribution to Human Rights Day. Uh, and it demonstrates the, uh, as I say, refined sensibility of the administration uh, in its human rights commitment, that part of the triad uh, on which the vision is based. Uh, also at the same time, the White House announced that uh, US aid was going to close down uh, 25 missions serving 31 of the poorest countries in the world as part of the cutback in what is in fact one of the most miserly foreign aid programs in the industrial world. Uh, uh, which is now being reduced still further. Uh, that's, again, another contribution to human rights. You'll remember, since it's Human Rights Day, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which allegedly we're dedicated, about half of it uh, is devoted to social and economic rights, uh, the rights to decent health care, to food, to work, to union organizing, and so on. The U.S. has always rejected that part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and this little action today, uh, a couple of days ago is another illustration of that. While rejecting the universality of the convention, we, of course, uh, uh, very uh, great pontificate at great length about uh, countries that don't meet our high standards and deny the uh, uh, universal validity of the convention. It's another thing to remember on Human Rights Day. Uh, as the Clinton administration uh, announced its agreement with China to provide high technology weapons, uh, they stated that there is, that there was no linkage, no linkage established between the high technology sales uh, and human rights issues. Well, that doesn't come as much of a surprise either. Uh, as you know, the Clinton administration is drawn to a substantial extent from officials of the Carter administration. The Carter administration opened its crusade for human rights uh, right after it came into office in 1977 by facing one of the toughest problems. Uh, at that time, uh, the United States was providing an enormous uh, amount of armaments to the Shah of Iran, who ranked quite high, maybe on top, 
uh, among human rights violators, uh, maybe had the record or came close to the record in torture of political prisoners and many other atrocities. And that posed a certain dilemma for the human rights crusade. And they faced it quite squarely. Uh, in April 1977, uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance uh, went to Iran and put pressure on the Iranians, namely to accept new, sophisticated, high technology military equipment, which Iran had not requested and probably couldn't even use, uh, and which apparently was going to be uh, run, managed, and run by US military forces. Uh, he was asked by reporters how this uh, comported with the human rights crusade, and stated that there was no linkage uh, raised between human rights issues in Iran and the sale of uh, high technology weapons, which were necessary for the benefit of US corporations. Uh, and so it proceeds. A uh, recent example was uh, George Bush and James Baker. Uh, as the Berlin Wall was tottering and falling, uh, giving a final end, symbolic end of the Cold War, uh, Bush and Baker were in internal deliberations since leak, uh, pressing for a, a billion dollars of new loans to their friend Saddam Hussein. Uh, over the objections of the Treasury and Commerce Department. Uh, the objections didn't have anything to do with gassing Kurds or uh, you know, torturing dissidents or anything marginal like that, but with the fact that, Iran, that uh, Iraq simply didn't appear to be credit worthy. But Bush and Baker overrode those objections and insisted that they get the, uh, the loans uh, because of the great commercial opportunities that Iraq was offering to American corporations and because they were contributing to the stability of the Middle East. Stability is one of those code words, which means they're doing pretty much what we tell them to do. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, uh, commitment to their great friend and ally continued up until the day uh, when Saddam Hussein uh, demonstrated that he wasn't contributing to stability, that is, he wasn't following orders, uh, at which point he made the usual transition from you know, favored friend uh, to uh, reincarnation of Attila the Hunt. Uh, so that's another example of our vision of human rights. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of intriguing to watch over the years, Carter, Reagan, Bush, uh, Clinton, uh, to see uh, what changes as one vision replaces another. Uh, I leave it to those of you with sufficiently refined sensibility to see if you can detect what changes. Well, that was the apogee. That was the peak of the grand achievements, the Seattle summit. Let's go back to the one that immediately preceded it. Uh, the one that immediately preceded it was the passage of, uh, of NAFTA, the executive version of NAFTA, uh, in mid-November. Uh, uh, the, 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 what was going on right at that period, right before the House vote and right after it, is extremely interesting and revealing. Uh, there was a kind of crescendo of hysteria building up in the, among political leaders and in the press, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, usually the political leaders and the press commentators try to repress their class loyalties. Uh, they don't want them to be too much on the surface. They try to take a pose of being above the fray. But this time that didn't happen. It all came out in the open. Actually, the New York Times even used the phrase class lines. I don't think I've ever seen that before uh, in the press. It's one of the things we're not supposed to say. Uh, too much was at stake, and it was impossible to keep it quiet. Uh, in the days before the vote, days immediately before the vote, you recall that Clinton was uh, speaking publicly about, I'll quote his words, the real roughshod, muscle-bound tactics of organized labor the raw muscle, the sort of naked pressure that the labor forces have put on, uh, plead, in, involving pleading based on friendship and threatening based on money and work in the campaign when they approach their elected representatives. You obviously never see a corporate lobbyist sinking that low. Uh, there were front page stories uh, which uh, featured the president's call to Congress uh, to resist the hardball politics of the powerful labor interests. Business was reeling from the onslaught, you know, to barely 
barely faced the terror of the mob. Uh, Anthony Lewis uh, wrote a, uh, at the far left, you know, uh, wrote an article in which he denounced the labor movement as backward and unenlightened. Uh, the crude, threatening tactics used by unions to make Democratic members of the House vote against NAFTA underline that point. Uh, labor was driven by fear of change and fear of foreigners, really dangerous people. Uh, the, Times the Times had an editorial the day, of the, the day right before the vote, uh, attacking, uh, listing the Rep that little box in the editorial listing the representatives from the New York area who had announced they were going to vote against NAFTA, and next to every one of them, they had a, they listed the am the, the amount of contr the contributions they had received from uh, labor in their last political campaign, uh, and the Times pointed out that that's rather ominous. It's an unsettling pattern. It indicates that maybe these people aren't voting their consciences, but are just being threatened by the. Uh, uh, crude, threatening tactics and the raw muscle of labor. Uh, well, as a number of the aggrieved representatives later pointed out, uh, no one, the Times had not listed uh, corporate contributions to representatives, nor for that matter had it listed uh, attitudes of Times advertisers towards uh, NAFTA and asked whether that suggests an unsettling pattern about their enthusiastic support for it. Uh, but. To criticize the press for this is a little bit unfair for several reasons. For one thing, it's kind of unnecessary to point out, to discuss corporate contributions. That's like reporting on the fact that you breathe air when you walk around. I mean, if that's the way the country's supposed to run, it's supposed to be run by powerful business interests. That's taken for granted. So it's no, you know, it's no threat to functioning democracy if corporate lobbyists twist people's arms and pour huge amounts of money uh, into the campaign and so on, that's just the way it's supposed to work. It's when labor tries to get involved. It's when working people try to become involved in influencing legislation that's a real threat to democracy and you have to get hysterical about it. Uh, furthermore, it's again unfair to criticize the Times for not pointing this out because they did indeed have a front page story comparing uh, labor lobbying with corporate lobbying in which they, the reporter Michael Wines act, act, accurately pointed out that there was just no comparison. I mean, corporate lobbyists were in, you know, fancy suites right next to the house floor with uh, all kind of, um, you know, fancy telephones and appurtenances and celebrities all over the place. Uh, labor, they said you could find, you know, a couple of blocks down the road in a boiler room somewhere without any telephones and, you know, so on. Uh, they quoted one uh, corporate lobbyist who was in the Carter administration and was looking at this and saying it's going to be a complete blowout. There's no worry about it. Uh, so they did tell the story accurately. Uh, the, it was a slight problem. The story was published the day after the vote. Uh, but uh, again, it's unfair to criticize them for that. You know, the newsroom is a busy place and <laughs> things sometimes fall between the cracks you know, and so on. Uh, but what's interesting about the hysteria, and it was real hysteria, I mean, the examples that I cited are, are illustrative, uh, is uh, that it illustrates that the traditional hatred for democracy among privileged elites, which is, after all, not very surprising because democracy would threaten privilege, uh, that this is not just hatred of democracy, but it's passionate hatred of democracy. If the mob, the rabble, ever begins to become involved in something like requesting that their representatives do something, uh, well, you know, the civilization is coming to an end. It's not just a small problem from the point of view of a spectrum of opinion running from, say, Anthony Lewis over to the right, but it's a major problem. In fact, it's a catastrophe. Uh, that reflects hatred of democracy, which is true passion. passion. And again, it won't surprise anyone who's familiar with intellectual history. If you go back to the 17th century, first modern democratic revolutions in the 17th century in England, and you look at the way you know, the privileged classes and the educated were responding to efforts of the rabble to become involved in the political process, the hysteria was very similar. In fact, nothing has changed since those days except that now it's rarely necessary to rise to these heights because usually the mob is kept under better control. 
uh, the people who Walter Lippmann once called the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, meaning the general population, uh, generally don't intrude where they're not where they don't belong, like in the political arena. But when they do, you really have to beat them down because uh, otherwise we're in bad trouble. Well, uh, uh, Clinton's performance on the NAFTA issue again won great praise. Uh, the front, there was an, another front page article in the New York Times the day the vote passed by their Washington correspondent, R.W. Apple, in which he, I, I can't duplicate this, so I'll quote it for you. Uh, he said, Mr. Clinton retreated early on Bosnia, on Haiti, on homosexuals in the military, on important elements of his economic plan. That's a reference to the tiny stimulative package. He seemed ready to compromise on all but the most basic elements of his health care reforms. Critics asked whether he had a bottom line on anything. On NAFTA, he did, and that question won't be asked for a while. In other words, he silenced his detractors. When it's simply a matter of the lives of millions of people, uh, our man uh, uh, is pragmatic and knows how to give up. But when it comes to the call to answer to responding to the call of business power, he showed he really has backbone after all. So there is a bottom line, uh, and uh, our, our hero is, an, is a man of principle, as we had hoped. Uh, well, that's, again, a natural reaction to uh, a conflict where a great deal was perceived to be at stake. And it's, it's interesting to ask exactly what was perceived to be at stake that caused this hysterical reaction in which class loyalties were expressed with such complete candor and, in fact, fanaticism. Uh, well, um, a, uh, an article that appeared in the, another article that appeared in the New York Times the day after the vote, that seems like one of my favorite issues of the New York Times, that day after the vote. There was another one which uh, gave the first analysis uh, that the Times had presented of what the economic effects of the NAFTA agreement were likely to be for the New York region. Uh, and it was, it spelled them out. Uh, well, let me see if I got it here. It said that there would be many gainers. Uh, the gainers would be sectors based in and around finance, the region's banking, telecommunications, and service for, for firms, insurance companies, investment houses, corporate law firms, the PR industry, a vast assortment of such professional service firms from management consultants and public relations to law and marketing. They're all poised to seek new businesses in Mexico. Banks and Wall Street securities firms, which would probably draw more benefit from the pact than any other businesses, say they're itching to buy Mexican businesses or invest in them. Uh, some manufacturers would gain, namely high-tech industry and pharmaceuticals, uh, both of which would benefit, they didn't mention this, but I add, would benefit from the increased protection. Uh, uh, NAFTA, this version of NAFTA is highly protectionist, which is why uh, American corporations liked it so much. Uh, and uh, a major part of that was increased protection for uh, patents and what's called intellectual property, generally provisions that are designed to ensure that the technology of the future and the products of the future will be monopolized by U.S.-based transnational corporations. Uh, in addition, they said two of uh, the region's two largest manufacturing industries would benefit, namely the capital-intensive uh, chemical industry, not many workers there, so they'll benefit, and publishing. Uh, well, they'll, of course, benefit from the highly protectionist measures that are being added. Publishing doesn't refer to covered action quarterly and the uh, uh, lies of our times, but to the enormous propaganda apparatus run by the corporate system, which will indeed benefit. Incidentally, that they didn't ask whether that raises some ominous questions about the Times editorial position, but I'll put that one aside. Uh, they also mentioned, there's a couple of sentences scattered in the article that says, well, you know, it's not perfect. There's going to be a few losers, too. Here's the losers. Predominantly women, blacks, and Hispanics and semi-skilled production workers, which means about three-quarters of the workforce. So in other words, it's not perfect, you know, but uh, basically pretty good. Uh, going back to Anthony Lewis and labor being driven by fear of foreigners and fear of change and being unenlightened, I mean, looking at the predictions, one can perhaps draw some other conclusions. Uh, I should say that these analyses of the effects of NAFTA are quite general. Uh, across the board, if you look at economists who supported it, uh, which is almost all of them, and the few who questioned it, uh, they do agree on some things. 
uh, they agree that uh, it will have the effect of increasing the polarization of the society. That means the benefits from NAFTA will be highly concentrated in wealthy sectors, the kind that the Times listed. Uh, and the costs of NAFTA, this version of NAFTA, will, in fact, it's designed for this purpose. You can imagine other NAFTAs. But this NAFTA was designed so that the costs will spread over the whole population, who will probably suffer an absolute decline from it. So one of the most highly regarded analyses uh, uh, by a professor at UCLA estimates that uh, by the end of the decade, this version, he, I think, is in favor of NAFTA, that the, by the end of the decade, this, uh, this version of NAFTA will add about $3,000 uh, annual income to sectors of the kind that the Times listed among the gainers. Uh, and it will uh, lead to about a $700 a year annual decline, absolute decline in real income for uh, the losers that the Times indicated, the, the workforce by and large. Uh, and that'll average out, he estimated, to a to a loss for the general population of about $200 a year in real income by the end of the decade. Uh, well, exactly what effect NAFTA will have on you know, job flow is kind of hard to estimate. Those are sort of meaningless calculations because the economic models are so ridiculous that they don't tell you anything. Uh, but the effect on polarization is uh, very plausible, uh, very plausible, and in fact held with near unanimity. Uh, even the most fervent uh, advocates of NAFTA conceded that it's going to have this effect of uh, uh, harming semi-skilled workers, which again, I stress, means about 70 or 75 percent of the workforce, uh, and other losers like women, blacks, Hispanics, and you know, other kind of minor elements like that. Uh, well, uh, you can begin to see why uh, uh, NAFTA became a matter of such significance. To, uh, that's one reason why NAFTA became a matter of such significance to the uh, political class and the propaganda system and the, uh, the articulate, their articulate spokespersons. Uh, incidentally, what's the effect that's expected in Mexico? Interestingly, exactly the same. Uh, it's expected that the impact on Mexico will be structurally the same, although probably more drastic because it's a weaker economy. Uh, there will be sectors that will gain multinationals, which have Mexican bases, uh, uh, the people involved in them, corporate lawyers, uh, investors, uh, banks, and so on, they're likely to gain, just as in the United States, but there are many fewer of them, so there'll be less of a gain. And the losers are expected to be the workforce and the peasantry, fairly substantial losers, in fact. Uh, the leading financial journal in Mexico, which is very pro-NAFTA, uh, estimated that Mexico would lose about 25% of its manufacturing industry within the first two years and about 15% of its workforce. Uh, other analyses estimate that millions of peasants will be driven, it's happening anyway, but millions more peasants will be driven off the land by cheap agricultural exports from U.S. agribusiness. The net effect of this is to swell enormously the unemployed you know, reserve army uh, in Mexico, which naturally means driving down wages. Uh, it's obvious. Uh, there's no way to counter that in Mexico uh, because union organizing is, ranges from difficult to impossible. There were enormous protests in Mexico, not reported here, against the uh, agreement, mainly because Mexican workers and peasants can, uh, guessed, and, uh, and others, that the purpose and the effect of, of NAFTA would be to erode or destroy their con the constitutional guarantees for workers' rights and educational rights and so on. Those guarantees are significant. They're not always implemented, in fact, far from implemented, but the achievement of them was significant, and to eliminate them would be a major victory for transnational power. So the strong likelihood uh, is that uh, both in Mexico and the United States and, of course, in Canada, the agreement will uh, will increase the polarization, perhaps sharply, that's been taking place anyway. Inequality has been growing in the United States for the past 30 years. Uh, real wages have been declining uh, since about late 60s. Uh, the, uh, uh, they even began to decline for uh, people with college education during the Reagan years. Uh, the society is breaking up into two elements, uh, 
wealthy privileged sector and a superfluous use sector of people who are useless for wealth production and profit production, which is, of course, the only value, uh, the only human value, people having no human value in themselves apart from this under dominant ideologies. Uh, and the agreement is likely to drive all three countries into a uh, low-wage, low-growth equilibrium in which the population will suffer, but profits will increase. Actually, that's a very broadly held conclusion. It was the conclusion, for example, of the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment in an analysis of this version of NAFTA about a year ago. And I think it's, very, it, it's quite a reasonable analysis and indeed rather widely held. Uh, well, uh, there's, a, there's a still more important aspect to, the, to this version of NAFTA, which kind of explains, I think, the hysteria about it. Uh, it's a tremendous attack against democracy. Uh, and that's also recognized. Uh, you read over and over again that the point of NAFTA is to lock Mexico in to the current reforms, as they are called. Uh, that is, the uh, policies of opening up the economy, which have brought about the Mexican economic miracle, uh, uh, in which, incidentally, uh, uh, wages have dropped about 60% over the past decade and the share of labor in income has dropped from about 36% to 23%. That's a typical reaction, a, a consequence of structural adjustment, economic liberalization, and so on. And it's necessary to lock that in for Mexico uh, for reasons which, in fact, were described in a high-level Latin American strategy conference in Washington a couple of years ago, uh, which discussed the special relationship between the United States and Mexico and found it extraordinarily positive, completely untroubled by endemic torture and murder of union leaders and uh, the great decline in uh, real wages, uh, starvation, and so on. So the relationship was fine, but there was a cloud on the horizon, and that was this. Uh, a democracy opening in Mexico could test the special relationship by bringing into office a government more interested in challenging the United States on economic and nationalist grounds. In other words, you can't be sure that there might not be a democracy opening in Mexico. And if you have a democracy opening, maybe the rabble will start to express their views and interests, and they may challenge this nice arrangement, uh, and then we'd really be in trouble. So therefore, you better lock it in with agreements of a, roughly the status of a treaty, which are going to be hard to break out of. And so the same comment holds of the United States and Canada. Now, there have been great achievements by corporate power, increasingly transnational power, uh, in beating down wages and benefits and welfare and converting the state to a kind of a welfare system for the rich even more than before. And it's very important to lock all that stuff in, in case there might be a democracy opening here too someday. And the fear over such a democracy opening is exactly what inspired all of this hysteria about uh, the labor movement daring to petition its uh, uh, representatives and so on. Well, that's, uh, 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 I should say that th th this is all built into the mechanisms of these international agreements. Uh, so, uh, and it's not something to speculate about. They're perfectly clear examples already. So take, say, the Canadian-US aspect of it, which already illustrates what's coming and why corporate power and privilege is so, so, so committed to this. Uh, here's one example of the kind of thing we might look forward to. There are many. Uh, the province of Ontario, you know, there is a so-called free trade agreement between Canada and the United States. Uh, the uh, province of Ontario, uh, a, 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 in Ontario, legislation was proposed to institute a uh, no-fault public, publicly funded insurance uh, plan for auto insurance. Uh, that would be much cheaper and much more efficient than the current privately supported plan. The situation is analogous to the health system. It would be a system like the health system. You cut back a ton of bureaucracy and administrative costs. It becomes more efficient. And uh, it's also tax-based rather than individually funded, so it's not so regressive and so on. Well, that didn't get very far. It was challenged by US insurance companies who claimed that it was an illegal interference with free trade because it undercut their abilities to operate profitably in, in Canada. Well. Uh, the province of Ontario could have proceeded with litigation on this matter. 
but they dropped it. It would have been much too expensive, and the insurance companies have the money and the time and the fancy lawyers and so on. The public doesn't. So Ontario dropped it. Uh, if it had gone, to, uh, gone through the procedures specified by the Free Trade Agreement, it would have worked its way up to an adjudication panel, which operates in secret uh, uh, and is made up of corporate lawyers and trade representatives. And you can have a fair guess what the outcome of that will be. Uh, but the point, and that's typical. The point is to take away power from popular organizations, even parliamentary organizations, which are somewhat responsive to the public, remove power from them, transfer it to the corporations themselves the, and their representatives, uh, which uh, a, cor a corporation, in particular a transnational corporation, is basically a totalitarian system huge, incidentally. Many of them are bigger than most states. Uh, it's totalitarian in the sense that the decision-making is completely top-down and no influence from the outside. If it's transnational, even the limited influence that comes from national legislation is restricted. Uh, if, if power can be transferred into their hands, uh, we have an attack on democracy which is really efficient. Uh, it means that major decisions affecting our lives will be made in secret by completely unaccountable structures, huge in scale, you know, like they dominate about maybe 40% or so of world trade, so-called. It's 50% of U.S. exports to Mexico don't even enter the Mexican market. Uh, they're just, they happen to cross the border, uh, but they're from one branch of a U.S. corporation to another, and then they come right back again. That's trade only as a kind of joke. It's not trade at all. It's centrally managed interchanges, radically violating market conditions, of course, because the corporations don't pay attention to that in their internal transactions. Uh, so these are huge outfits, uh, unaccountable, absolutist in character. Uh, if power can be transmitted into their hands, then the residues of the democratic system become more and more meaningless. And that's very important. Uh, that's, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the idea of popular democracy, of the mob and the rabble getting involved in public affairs has always been anathema to privileged sectors. Uh, and here we have new opportunities for putting an end to this heresy forever uh, while maintaining formal procedures. You know, like you go every once in a while to, you know, push a lever here and there. Uh, well, you can see that it really is a matter of great significance, not so much because of job loss or gain, nobody knows anything about that, but because of the contribution to polarization uh, and the uh, destructive effects on popular democracy. Those are serious matters, hence the enormous hysteria. Uh, I might say that the next major achievement of the Clinton administration, the one you know which we could have talked about if this talk was a little later, namely the health plan, uh, has pretty much the same properties. Uh, the, the range of health plans considered in the United States, ranging from you know, Clinton's managed care over to several options further to the right, they have two crucial fa uh, properties uh, which uh, are required for a system, for a society that is business run and business run with, by a highly class conscious and very powerful business community. One, they're all radically regressive. Unlike every other industrial society, all the plans being considered here are soak the poor plans. Uh, a tax-based plan, for example, is as progressive as a tax system. A wage-based plan, at least, you know, you pay more if you get higher wages. Uh, not very progressive, but, you know, at least not flat. Uh, the U.S. plans all are flat. Uh, in fact, it's probably going to turn out that the CEO pays less than the guy who empties his wastebasket because he has fancier lawyers to figure out how to get tax deductions and so on. So these are, at best, absolutely flat, meaning radically regressive plans, soak the poor plans of a kind unknown in other industrial societies. Uh, and that's a fact about these plans that almost never mentioned. In fact, you do a research project and try to find out how many references you can find to that rather significant fact in the uh, uh, extensive discussion in the media about uh, the health plan. And the second element, which in fact is discussed, uh, is that the, all these plans place uh, major control in the hands of insurance companies. And that means half dozen huge insurance companies. 
Uh, Hillary Clinton was on television a couple of weeks ago denouncing insurance companies, but if you looked closely, uh, you'll notice that the insurance companies that she was denouncing were the small insurance companies, the ones that are going to be wiped out by these plans. The big insurance companies were notably quiet, kind of applauding quietly in the background, uh, because they're the ones who are going to be the gainers. Incidentally, the Wall Street Journal uh, noticed this and pointed out that Clinton is uh, typical of Democrats in that his real commitments are to big business, not to the entire business community. In this respect, the Democrats are somewhat different from the Republicans who are just the business party, you know. But the Democrats have a kind of more nuanced uh, attitude toward the business community. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one of the numerous respects in which they mention that Clinton is a particularly good friend to big business. Uh, well, uh, that's the health program. Notice again, it's going to have the same kinds of social effects as well. And of course, to have the insurance companies run it means that the public pays the enormous costs of an insurance company-based program. Uh, that means folks like us are going to pay for the big executive salaries, like the $23 million annual salary of uh, the CEO of uh, Aetna. Uh, uh, they'll pay for the profits of the insurance companies, which are enormous, pay for their advertising costs, which are enormous, and all the other corporate prerogatives. Uh, and they'll also pay the huge administrative costs because the insurance companies are going to make very sure that they micromanage doctors to guarantee that they don't give any more health care than the companies can possibly get away with. And then the, gump the government's going to have another big bureaucracy monitoring the insurance companies to, you know, just so they don't totally run away with the store. And all of that is going to be costs added on. And those are all required uh, for the uh, health care system. Well, what about public opinion on all these matters? That's interesting. In the case of NAFTA, in all three countries, United States, Mexico, and Canada, public opinion was opposed. Uh, it's interesting, in Canada, overwhelmingly opposed. In the United States, it was running pretty steadily at about 60% opposition among the part of the public who had a point of view, uh, which is kind of intriguing since the propaganda was about 100% in favor, and in fact, enthusiastically in favor. In Mexico, the latest polls that were taken showed 47% pro-NAFTA. I don't exactly know what the polls mean, like how much did they poll peasants and unemployed workers and so on. Anyway, general opposition in all three countries. Uh, in the health care, it's exactly the same. Polls have been taken on health in the United States for about 40 years now. And one consistent feature of them is that either uh, absolute majorities or considerable pluralities have been in favor of the kind of health care system that you have in every other industrial center country, some version of a national health care system, either tax-based or something similar. Uh, the latest polls are running about 60 or 70 percent in favor of that, although it's off the agenda. Uh, all discussion is about other uh, uh, proposals. Now, sometimes in paragraph 26, you'll see a reference to the fact that the public is in favor of what's here called a Canadian-style plan, basically the kind they have elsewhere. Uh, but there's a technical term to eliminate this irrelevance. It's called politically unrealistic. That means it's only the public who wants it, uh, not the big corporations and the wealthy and so on. So therefore, it's politically unrealistic and therefore off the spectrum. It's only advocated by that crude, uh, threatening mob, uh, you know, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders and so on. Well, NAFTA, again, is going to contribute to polarization, which means it's a major social engineering project, part of a, it's actually part of a major in social engineering project, which is contributing to polarization of the society, actually across the world by now, it's an international phenomenon, uh, coming back to the industrial countries. Uh, 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 it, this, uh, this marginalization of large sectors, possibly even a majority of the population uh, has consequences. It leads to social disintegration, to breakdown of social, uh, uh, of, of families, of uh, social relations, and so on. It leads to violence and abuse. Uh, it leads to enormous amount of crime. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is not in the least surprising, in fact, rather symbolic, that a couple of days after the NAFTA agreement was passed, uh, the Senate passed uh, a huge anti-crime package. Well, that makes sense, too. 
if you're going to create social disintegration, you better figure out a way to control it. Uh, and how do you control it? Well, take a look at the crime package, uh, which also won enormous praise, I should say. Uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, for example, described it as the finest anti-crime bill in history. That's real praise for Bill Clinton. Uh, the, uh, uh, it added, you know, 100,000 more police, uh, new federal prisons. I think it was a six-fold increase in federal funding of uh, repressive institutions, security forces, in effect, uh, in 52 new federal crimes that get the death penalty, uh, it becomes a crime to be a member of a street gang, so-called, and on and on. A highly repressive package, very reasonable. Uh, if social engineering projects are leading to the disintegration of society and the breakdown of social norms uh, and marginalization of people, there's only two answers. Either you change the social policies, but that would harm the wealthy and the privileged, or else you figure out better ways to control and suppress them. So you turned to an anti-crime bill. So it came just at the right time and just in place. And all of this is very familiar from the third world, which we are more and more coming to resemble. Uh, so for example, John F. Kennedy uh, is famous, or should be famous, uh, for two major policies concerned with our backyard, Latin America. One was the Alliance for Progress, which was a polarization program. Uh, it led to economic miracles, meaning increasing uh, GNP, you know, gross national product and agro-export, and simultaneously increasing malnutrition and starvation and suffering and so on. So split into benefits for the wealthy and suffering for the vast majority. And that required a complementary program, also instituted by Kennedy at the same time. Uh, in 1962, the Kennedy administration made an, a historic decision, a major a decision of major importance. Uh, it shifted the mission of the Latin American military. We're powerful enough to do that. It shifted the mission of the Latin American military from hemispheric defense, holdover from the Second World War, to internal security, meaning war against your own population. And that was a necessary corollary to Alliance for Progress style development programs. Uh, that set off a huge wave of repression throughout the hemisphere. I'll just quote the uh, the Kennedy official, Kennedy administration official who was in charge of counterinsurgency, Charles Machling, years later, pointed out that this, uh, this Kennedy administration initiative uh, changed U.S. policy, his words, from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct complicity in the methods of Heinrich, of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. Uh, and indeed, that's one of uh, Kennedy's lasting uh, contributions. Uh, and rather typical of Camelot, I should say, and a, a, a kind of a vicious, a particularly vicious analog of the domestic counterpart that we're now seeing enacted, the logic being essentially the same. Uh, well, again, that got great praise. Uh, let's quickly go back to the uh, announcement of the vision back in late September. Uh, again, highly praised the headlines like vision of foreign policy revised and so on. Uh, the, uh, in late uh, September, there were three major, the, the, the announcement of the vision had three major components. Uh, there was a White House intervention panel. There was a, uh, nas a national econom international economic policy announced. And then the intellectual foundations of the new vision were explained by the National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake. That was all in a couple of days of, last, of late September. Uh, the intervention panel concluded that from now on we would not, the, it said in effect that the age of altruism is over. So we're not going to be nice guys anymore in intervention. Uh, I don't have to waste time on describing what happened when we were nice guys. Anyway, that's over. Uh, now intervention is to be guided by the principle, what's in it for us? Okay, those were the words, in fact, that the New York Times highlighted in describing the panel. So no more nice guy. From now on, it's what's in it for us. That's the intervention panel. Uh, the uh, economic panel, the economic ex the, uh, export strategy that was announced uh, stated, well, I mean, it was sort of encapsulated rather nicely by the Secretary of Treasury, Lloyd Benson, who said, I'm tired of this level playing field business. 
uh, from now on, we're going to have the playing field tilted in favor of American business. Okay. So the, meth the, the Reagan administration was breaking records, actually, in violating uh, free trade agreements, like so-called free trade agreements, like GATT, and then introducing protection. They, in fact, approximately doubled the uh, percentage of imports uh, uh, subject to one or another form of protection. Uh, James Baker, when he was Secretary of Treasury, proudly announced to the business community that the Reagan administration had been more protectionist had been more radical in violating market principles than all post-war administrations combined, which was quite true. It's left to the intellectuals to uh, produce odes to our devotion to the free market. This is important stuff. No time for that. Uh, but the Clinton panel announced that that wasn't enough. They were going to go beyond the sporadic and uh, sort of random uh, violations of GATT and other agreements by the Reaganites, and they were going to do it in a more systematic way uh, with uh, huge export-import bank loans to force other countries to purchase uh, U.S. Uh, exports and other uh, such measures, which are recognized to be in violation of GATT and to be market distorting, but, you know, uh, we've got to tilt the playing field even more in favor of U.S. corporations than before. Well, that was the second uh, element of the new strategy. And the third element, uh, Anthony Lake, said that we're going to go from containment to enlargement. In the past, we had been containing threats to democracies, uh, as, for example, in Iran and Guatemala and the Dominican Republic and Chile, and you can go on and add the rest, your readers of this journal, uh, and on through the 80s. So that's when we were containing threats to democracy. And now we're going to enlarge, enlarge what we've been doing before. And all of this was parroted without question by what most must be the most servile intellectual class in the world raised no question about how we'd been containing threats to democracy. For example, when we overthrew the parliamentary government of Brazil and installed a bunch of uh, neo-fascist monsters and on and on. Well, uh, anyhow, we're going to enlarge what we've been doing in the past, not be limited to what we have succeeded in doing. So there are a lot of ways that you could proceed. For example, there's about half a million children a year uh, who die uh, from the costs of debt reduction. And we should be able to do better than that. After all, half a million a year is a very large number. So maybe we can enlarge what we've been doing in the past. Uh, there are 11 million who die a year uh, from, uh, because, uh, in the third world uh, because uh, they have been left by Western colonialism in a state of a disaster and a despair, and the West has been tightening the noose ever since and won't give a few pennies of aid uh, that might be enough to save children dying from diarrhea and so on. And 11 million children, again, is not a huge number. I mean, after all, population is a big problem. So maybe we can do something about that. We can get it a little better. Uh, in the last 30 years, the gap between the richest and the poorest countries has doubled. Back around 1960, it was about 30 to 1, the 20 percent richest and 20 percent poorest. The gap was about 30 to 1. Uh, it's gone up to about 60 to 1, thanks to a combination of protectionist policies in the rich countries, which have become much more protectionist in recent years, and liberalization for the poor countries, which has you know, the effects of imposing market discipline, highly destructive. Uh, uh, those fa figures themselves, however, are highly misleading. Because if you take the, the same UN figures and you look at the top 20% of people, not countries, but you know, the, the, uh, the top 20% of people in wealth and the bottom 20% in wealth, the gap has in fact extended to 140 to 1. So it's far greater than the gap between the richer nations and the poorer nations, which means the gaps are primarily, about half of them are internal to each society. These are the polarizing tendencies that we have uh, been witnessing here as well, and which are highly praised by the business press. So, for example, the Wall Street Journal had a very enthusiastic article about a month ago uh, describing what they called a welcome development of transcendent importance. Uh, namely, wages in the United States had sunk to below any industrial country 
except for England, which had done even better in beating down the working class and the poor. Uh, we hadn't yet made it to South Korea and Taiwan, and Papua New Guinea was still a couple of steps beyond. Uh, but that's another way in which we can enlarge the vision as we proceed into the future. And new policies are, in fact, designed for that. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's now reached a point. I mean, th th these have a lowering effect on everyone, notice. In an, in an era where productive labor can be transferred to high repression, low wage areas very easily, in an, era, in an era of internationalization of production and finance, it's very easy. The, the lowering of wages in one place has an automatic effect of lowering them everywhere. So lowering Mexican wages will lower U.S. wages, lowering U.S. wages, lowering German wages. Uh, it's, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by everything that you presented to us tonight. Uh, what can individuals do to help promote change uh, here in the United States and abroad? Well, alone, they really can't do anything very much, uh, which is exactly why every social change in history uh, and every advance in history, and there are plenty of them, uh, has come from concerted, organized public action. Uh, that's why we don't live under feudalism. That's why we don't have slavery. Uh, that's why... Uh, uh, there's, uh, we've achieved a level, certain level of civil rights. Uh, that's why uh, women's issues got onto the agenda in the last years. That's why, uh, you know, questions about the environment, meaning the possibility that our children or their children may have a world to live in, uh, became issues. Uh, it was never given by a gift from above. Uh, it was always given by struggle. Uh, sometimes the struggles achieve, sometimes they're beaten back. I mean, take, say, labor struggles in the United States. The, United, uh, the unions have typically been, in, in many countries, one of the dominant, if not the dominant, agency of uh, progressive social change, of in, in improving the welfare of the general population. The United States is a business-run society to an unusual extent. That's why we are off the spectrum on things like health care and so on. Uh, it also happens to have an unusually violent labor history. Uh, U.S. workers didn't get the rights that were pretty standard in Europe uh, until the 1930s, about 50 years afterwards, after a very violent and brutal struggle, I should say, with hundreds of workers killed by security forces and so on. Uh, so then they finally got, say, the right to organize and the 40-hour week, those rights were quickly lost. Uh, the, uh, there was a tremendous business offensive to try to beat back those gains. Business was terrified by them. You read the business press in the 30s after the right to organize was finally won. And there's talk about uh, how the rising political power of the masses is the greatest hazard facing industrialists. And unless their thinking is redirected, we're going to face disaster. Uh, the kind of vulgar Marxist rhetoric is normal for business publications. I should say the values are opposite, but the beliefs are the same uh, uh, about how the world works. Uh, the, uh, and immediately after the Second World War, the, those victories were beaten back. The 40-hour week is a thing of the past. Uh, the right to organize is a thing of the past. I think I broke this. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, unions are declining, and with them, the one of the means by which people can uh, participate in a meaningful way in changing their lives. The hysteria about the effort of working people through their organizations to enter the political arena shows you just how much is at stake. But it also answers your question. Uh, what you should do is exactly the kinds of things that are going to lead to hysteria among uh, uh, privileged and uh, uh, powerful people. You know. And they indicate very clearly what those things are and uh, just follow the lead. You know. <laughs> Professor Shamsky, uh, I'd like you to go beyond the next vision thing, the health care thing, and go to we welfare reform and talk about what we can expect in terms of welfare reform. Well, first of all, when you talk about welfare, we ought to be a little honest about it. Uh, what's called welfare is public uh, programs that provide funds for poor people. That's called welfare. Public programs that provide funds for rich people are not called welfare. But in fact, that's what most of the public funds are. 
Uh, so, for example, now the way it's done, you know, it's like, you know, aid for mothers with dependent children, that you see. I mean, you don't see much, but, uh, you know, a few pennies go that way. You don't see fiscal policies which amount to exactly the same thing. So, like tax benefits. Uh, tax benefits on, say, home mortgages are a welfare payment. Right? That's ex they're equivalent, identical to a welfare payment. If, if, you, if you pay less for your mortgage, that's the same as if some public fund gave you more. It's identical. And in fact, if you look at the welfare benefits that are disguised by fiscal measures, like uh, real estate taxes and the uh, corporate prerogatives that are untaxed and so on, it's enormous. They almost all go to the most wealthy sector. Uh, and I don't think anybody's, you know, this is not the kind of thing that people study much. Uh, but the few attempts that have been made to evaluate it indicate that they probably exceed all of so-called welfare. And that's only the beginning. Uh, what about uh, the Boeing Corporation again? Uh, these models for the future. Well, that's a huge welfare program. Uh, the payments, the taxes that you, your taxes that go to the Pentagon and NASA and uh, DOE and the rest of them, that's an enormous welfare program, most of which gets funneled quite directly to advanced sectors of industry and to their investors and their owners. Uh, and the uh, top managerial levels, and some of it trickles down to parts of the workforce. But primarily, if you look at the distribution of funds, it's a tremendous welfare program for the rich. Uh, the same with uh, export-import bank loans. That's your taxes, remember. Uh, and they're going to... Uh, compel foreign countries to purchase uh, exports from U.S.-based manufacturers, who for all you know may be producing abroad, maybe having their production done abroad because they're multinationals. Well, you, you try to add up all this stuff, there's, there are enormous welfare programs which go primarily to the wealthy and the powerful. And that's not a big surprise after all. I mean, they have to all run the state apparatus. Why be surprised if they design it in their interests? Uh, uh, this is a truism that goes back to people like Adam Smith, in fact, it's obvious. Uh, so when you talk about welfare reform, uh, remember what's being discussed under that rubric is a little tiny fraction of it, namely the part that helps some poor people. Well, you know, how should that be reformed? In my opinion, it should be reformed by enormously expanding it and cutting back on the welfare of the rich. Uh, but uh, those are topics that are not going to be on the agenda. Uh, the welfare programs for the rich are not going to be on the agenda unless people like you put them there. Then they can be on the agenda. Like voting rights for black people were put on the agenda by struggle, not because somebody decided to give a gift and so on for everything else. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I can't see it too well. Yeah. Okay. In the past, you took a very principled and controversial stand with regard to Cambodia. And without siding with Pol Pot, you did a lot of exposure of the lies and maneuvering of the imperialists that were you know, operating in that situation. And I would have hoped that you would apply that same approach to what's happening in Peru today. In Peru? Yeah. yeah. And that where there are workers together with peasants fighting not just for workers' rights within the existing system, but for what Marx talked about as the fundamental right, and that's the workers' right to run the state. And uh, I think that, you know, there's some very vicious lies and disinformation campaigns that have been launched by the Peruvian government and by the U.S. standing behind them and calling the shots. And also new standards being set around, you know, abuses of human rights. Uh, with regard to political prisoners that are having wide-ranging effects. You know, will you do more to expose these things? Well, uh, it's perfectly true that in, I don't know how well you could hear, but in Peru, there, I mean, I'm, I, I'll put it in my terms, which may not be the terms you intended. Uh, there are two terrorist forces. Uh, there's the state, state security forces, which are major terrorist forces. And there is uh, Shining Path, which is another terrorist force. Now, if you try to add up the, the measure, the scale of these terrorist forces, the evidence indicates that the state terrorists are considerably more efficient. And that comes out even in, you know, you take a look at, say, the, human, the reports of the Human Rights Watch and have a look, or Amnesty International. I think that that's fairly clear. On the other hand, uh, to say that the Shining Path is working for the uh, benefit of workers and peasants, in my opinion, is a very serious distortion of the facts. They may, some of them may, some of the people may be, but as groups, they're violent terrorist forces which are intimidating 
uh, and undermining uh, many attempts at popular organization. That's not to justify the terrorist forces of the state, but to give what at least I think is an accurate description of the situation. Uh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you've done any studies on the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, I called them the other day just out of curiosity, and the woman in their Middle East section got very surprised. She said, well, you know, how did you hear about us? You know, nobody knows about it. Even Americans don't know right. about us. <laughs> so I think that... <laughs> uh, I haven't personally done any, but there are studies going on about it. There's uh, the um, Resource Center in, I uh, wish I had the address, but it's Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico, right? Yeah, they have a project called the National Endowment for Democracy Project, which has done some good stuff. Uh, anybody remember an address offhand? Yeah, uh, I, I guess you guys probably have their address. Corporate action people, don't you? Pardon? Council on Historic Affairs, do they work? Do they have a project on, on the NED also? Yeah. With the Resource Center, I see. So there's a joint publication of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs in Washington and the Resource Center in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, right? Yeah. William, Robinson's book. Uh, William Robinson's book is on the special case, right. namely on, on the NED and other involvement in the Nicaraguan election, yeah. But these projects are about the whole affair. And it's, uh, you know, it's about what you'd expect from a bipartisan uh, democracy campaign. It's attempting to impose what is called democracy, meaning rule by the rich and the powerful uh, without interference by the mob, uh, but within the framework of formal electoral procedures. And so like, this is not particularly my opinion. This is an opinion which you can find from, for example, a, a source that I'd suggest you look at is the uh, leading uh, Reaganite official on, who worked on democracy enhancement projects in Latin America, and happens to be a very honest man, uh, Thomas Carruthers, who's had a book and several articles on Reagan's efforts to, uh, the Reaganite efforts to uh, bring about democracy in Latin America, which he takes very seriously and says they were all very sincere, but he also describes what happened, uh, and what he describes is that uh, the, there was a negative correlation between U.S. influence and democracy. The less the U.S. had influence, the more there were steps towards democracy. So where U.S. influence was the least, like in the southern cone of the continent, uh, there were the most steps for democracy. The U.S. also opposed them, strongly opposed them, uh, and tried to impede them, but then later took credit for them when they became irreversible, very much what happened in the Philippines and Haiti, incidentally. Uh, and uh, in, in 19, you know, when Marcos and Duvalier were overthrown. Uh, the, uh, uh, where the U.S. influence was greatest, uh, Central America and the Caribbean, the, uh, harm, the, well, he calls it progress to democracy was least. In fact, the destruction of democracy was greatest, is a more accurate way of putting it. Uh, and he then goes on to point out that what the U.S. sought, the ultimate objective of the United States, was top-down forms of democracy that left existing power structures which, which the U.S. had been allied in place. That's democracy. Uh, and that's right. And that applies at home, too. Uh, and that's what uh, the NED is about. And the kind of stuff I was talking about is just an illustration of it. You know, again, let me stress that the passion evoked by the attempt of working people to influence their legislators is very revealing that illustrates the passionate hatred for democracy uh, on the part of educated elites, which is nothing new. It runs all through the literature uh, and uh, uh, occasionally shows up in dramatic forms like this. And the NAD is, has that conception of democracy, not surprisingly. Can yeah. repeat the question? Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, Professor, what do you have to say about the recent uh, Enemy of the month, North Korea. You, not hardly a day passes when you see something on ABC, CBS, and NBC. Uh, not C-SPAN, by the way. But all the rest of the stations about how the uh, North Koreans are about to invade the world or something like of that nature. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so, so the question was, what about the current uh, enemy of the month? Was, that's what you put it, North Korea, which you hear about how they're going to conquer the world every day. 
Uh, well, the current, there's problems in the Korean Peninsula. I mean, North Korea is isolated and uh, uh, rather desperate and probably trying to figure out some way to get, you know, to enter into the international community. I think they're doing it in a pretty crude way, uh, using the threat of proliferation as a way to try to get some responses and benefits. They feel very threatened, and rightly so. And I think there could be a constructive reaction to this. But why is the U.S. Uh, reacting the way it is? Well, one thing we can wipe out pretty quickly, and that is the belief that the U.S. is reacting to North Korean proliferation because the Clinton, possible proliferation, because the Clinton administration is opposed to nuclear and missile proliferation. Uh, we can reject that hypothesis very quickly by simply looking at what I described. Uh, in, in the, remember that one of the great achievements, maybe the great achievement of the Asia Pacific Summit was the U.S. agreement to violate congressional legislation and send high technology equipment to China, which is directly involved in, in certainly missile and probably nuclear weapons proliferation. Well, that shows how much concerned they are with uh, nuclear weapons and missile proliferation. And many other things show the same thing. So whatever reason it is, it's not that. Uh, and I think the reasons are probably the usual ones. Uh, having rallying people around an enemy, uh, concern over uh, how to extend US power in the Northeast Pacific area, and so on. It's not that, you know, I, mean, I don't want to say that the problem of nuclear prolif possible proliferation in North Korea is a trivial problem. It's not a trivial problem. And it's probably real, you know, I would guess. Uh, but there are certainly are a lot more constructive ways to deal with it than these. And the arguments that are offered can't be considered seriously for a moment, if only for the reason I mentioned. Yeah. Based on your studies and observations, uh, what part of the plan by the rich in this country would the disillusion of the black family and crime, black on black crime in the inner cities of America what part, would that be a part of your thesis yeah. relative to the non-profitability of people? Yeah, so the question is how does the dissolution of the black family and black internal crime in the black community and you know the social breakdown there, how does that fit into this whole picture? Well, pretty straightforwardly actually. I mean, you know, the, the, the way the country's developed over the centuries, there were waves of immigrants who came in and they were usually very much persecuted. And as the economy was growing, either because we were conquering the territory or one thing or another, um, they were kind of slow, over time absorbed into the uh, society. So like say my parent, my father worked in a sweatshop when he came from uh, Russia and his son went to college. You know, okay, that's you know, the kind of thing that could happen. Uh, well, you know, the, late, the last great immigration into the United States, there were two recent major immigrations. Uh, one was the black immigration. Now, it's not usually called an immigration because it was internal, but mechanization of farming in the South uh, forced a huge black population to the North, uh, and that's, it's equivalent to an immigration. It's as if they'd come from Alaska, you know, as far as the system was concerned. Uh, for, there was a brief period when it could be absorbed, namely during the Second World War when there were jobs. Uh, after that, uh, there's been a period of you know, stagnation of production, wor of productive work, and in fact, actually decline recently. So you know, it's, it's actually declining. And that simply means that that population can't be absorbed. The Latino uh, uh, immigration is another one. It's an immigration in a period when there is not the kind of growth taking place that could absorb uh, highly repressed and exploited immigrants, uh, like you know, people from Eastern Europe say, or South Italy at one point, or Ireland at one point. Uh, so what you're left, and in fact, uh, this has these two immigrations, if you like, have coincided with a period of increased of attack on workers' rights, on production, uh, of, on welfare, of uh, polarization, the kind I was discussing. So you have this huge population, which happens to be heavily, though not only, of course, uh, black and uh, Latino. And what do you do with them? Well, same thing you do with them in the third world. Uh, uh, either you lock them up in jail, or you lock them up in concentration camps called inner cities, uh, in which you hope that they will prey on one another. 
uh, and uh, you put uh, guards around to make sure that they don't get out in vari various ways of doing this. Uh, uh, since, it, since there happens to be a race class correlation, it makes it easier because you can, to a significant extent, identify the, you know, the superfluous classes by skin color or something like that. Uh, but if they were white, it would come out about the same, in my opinion. You know, that just makes it easier. It doesn't change the situation. Uh, and that's why you have things like uh, the social engineering projects, like uh, the crime bill uh, and uh, others, uh, which uh, are a, a reaction to the fact that there is a population which is essentially useless for wealth production, for, for profit making by the wealthy. And therefore, they have to be controlled and marginalized. And if they just attack one another, that's perfect. You know, then, on the other hand, if they start attacking somebody else, that's not so good. Uh, so if, uh, if uh, you know, crime in the inner city is just violence directed against women and, you know, black people killing each other, other poor people slaughtering each other or whatever, okay, then it gets sort of, you know, back pages of the papers. If it breaks out into the white sectors, that's a different story, you know, or the rich sectors. And this, there's all kind of ways in which this is done. I mean, you know, you don't even need laws. I mean, take, say, where I live. I live in a, a suburb of Boston, you know, middle-class suburb of Boston, professional people and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's almost, I would, it's, not, it's not actually lily white, but it's really close. Uh, if a uh, black teenager drives into town in a car, it'll be 30 seconds before the police pick him up, you know. Now, there's no law about that, but it just happens, you know. Uh, when uh, there was a discussion about extending the, uh, the, 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 there's a subway system in Boston, and a couple of years ago there was some talk about extending it from the, inner, the city where it works uh, out to the suburbs, you know. So it went as far as Harvard Square, and they wanted to move it a little bit further. Uh, there are two towns right down the way. One of them's Arlington, one's Lexington, other than Lexington. Uh, Arlington is kind of lower middle class, white working class, and so on. Lexington, and that's right, that's kind of like professional and you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, both towns, Arlington and Lexington, were strongly opposed to extending the subway line, which would be extremely convenient, I should say, you know, save a tremendous amount of time and money and everything else. They were both opposed. Arlington, the uh, white, mostly white, ethnic working class and lower middle class town were very straight about it. They said why they were opposed. You know, they didn't want those black kids from Dorchester getting on for a quarter or whatever it was and walking around the streets of Arlington. Uh, in Lexington, you're more sophisticated, you know. So people, and they're all, everybody's a liberal, you know, vote for McGovern and that sort of thing. So that's not the reason that was given. Uh, there were much more complex reasons given with, you know, multisyllable words and so on. Uh, but essentially, that's what it came down to. And these are techniques for keeping, uh, you know, the wrong people uh, isolated where they belong. Uh, in some places, it's becoming quite extreme. Uh, Chicago, for example, I don't know if they've implemented this, maybe some of you know, but there was a plan in Chicago announced by the mayor's office about a year ago, I think, to break the city into regions, neighborhoods, and to limit access between the neighborhoods and to have those limited accesses controlled, uh, meaning people are just going to be kept to their own neighborhoods. Now, my feeling, I don't know if that was implemented or not, uh, but things like that are happening and are going to continue happening. And what's more, they're going to have popular support because as the people are afraid of crime and they're right to be afraid of it, it's frightening. You know? And if the causes of it are not going to be addressed, uh, the causes in social disintegration and polarization and so on. If that's not going to be addressed, the only way people are going to have to, be th if, uh, to, to feel that they can react is by violence and repression, just to, so that their kids can walk the streets. Uh, well, you know, again, that's the result of lack of, social, of organization. It's a result of lack of popular organizations, which enables the powerful to avoid the causes and just treat the symptoms in very violent ways. And something better be done about that because it's extending very significantly over the whole uh, urban society. Uh, I must uh, say, my dear friend Noam, that uh, we only have this hall for about seven more minutes. Oh, okay. We have a lot of uh, 
people here, and we're ever so appreciative to know him. I think we can say without question that he has given us a great deal of wisdom tonight. He is uh, today. Since you're I'm saying not finished nice yet. things. You can. No, you're not finished lessons. yet. Uh, you're going to insult me. You can stay. No, right. no, no, no. <laughs> Never. Uh, I was going to say one more question before I say that. I would like to let you know uh, that Noam has done, I think I've counted correctly, seven different events or programs or interviews or uh, another speech this morning. He's really done a great effort. He got on a plane this morning at about dawn. Uh, before you leave, I hope that you know that you can, those of you who are not already subscribers to Covert Action Quarterly, you can get one of these uh, leaflets out of the door. You can also purchase one of our coffee mugs. It can also double as a scotch or bourbon mug or a lemon juice mug, what you wish. Uh, there is time for one more question, and I must ask that it be brief. Thank you. You, you pick, because I don't want to be blamed for picking. All right, why don't, yeah. What is your prognosis, your personal prognosis, for a comprehensive test ban treaty and your own outlook for the extension of the proliferation treaty. Thank so you. So what's my prognosis about the uh, comprehensive test ban treaty and um, real implementation of the non-proliferation treaty? I think it's the same answer to every such question. If people, if, if none of us, if nobody does anything about it, it's not gonna happen. Uh, it is not in the perceived self-interest of the powerful. Therefore, it will not happen. Just as, you know, Clinton is being lauded uh, for his achievement at the summit, which contributed directly to proliferation of nuclear weapons and missiles. Uh, and at the same time, he's being praised for opposing proliferation. And now, you know, if the population is not going to respond in some fashion, that's the way it's going to go. Uh, same as on every other issue. The answer is always boringly the same. If we do something about it, it can change. If we don't, it's going to go in ways which are quite predictable.